It's Wednesday, August 27th, 2014, and this is the Arizona Mining Review. I'm your host, Lee Allison, here at the Arizona Geologic Survey headquarters in Tucson, Arizona. And joining us, as he does every month, is Niall Nemeth, head of our Economic Geology program based in Phoenix. Niall, welcome to the program, and you got a lot of news to report this month. Surprisingly, uh, there's always new industry events that, and, uh, you know, deals, et cetera, that get announced. It's great. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I, I heard about one uh, that's come out here just in the last few days. Yeah, recently we've had an announcement from Red Hawk that they've signed a joint venture agreement with Anglo-American. It's going to be on their Copper Creek project, which is located uh, oh, about 45 miles northeast of Tucson. People know where the San Manuel mine was. It's just across the San Pedro Valley to the east. So this is another copper play. It's going to be a, a copper play in the Galliero Mountains. For a number of years, Red Hawk's been exploring the district. Oh, way back in time, we had a company, I believe it was called AMT, that was once going to start a uh, renewed production on some of the high-level breccias. Back in the late 70s, some of these oxidized uh, breccia pipes were mined and uh, leached. But now they're looking at both those higher-level pipes as well as at the deep porphyry system or deeper porphyry system. Well, it's pretty significant that uh, somebody as big as Anglo-American is stepping in. Uh, just how big a deal is this? Well, you know, it's, uh, again, a situation where some bad news elsewhere has ended up being good news for Arizona. Anglo-American had been, Anglo -American had been a 50 percent partner with Northern Dynasty up in Alaska on the Pebble Project, which has gotten uh, initially rebuffed in terms of its uh, viability for permitting by the EPA. And so we've had Anglo-American come down to Arizona recently and establish an exploration office. And by the uh, various folks I chat with and, and visits I've seen, I know they've been reviewing a number of Arizona properties and projects. So Anglo-American really hadn't been working here in Arizona until, until uh, just the past few months. And it looks like they're moving very quickly here with this investment. Yeah, over the decades that I've been around Arizona, I've seen them here but uh, never have gotten really established in a project or a property to the extent that this joint venture will allow them. They've got a deal signed. They're going to form a new joint venture company. And the commitment is for five years to earn a 60% interest. If they uh, continue for an additional two years and meet a spending target, they can earn an 80% interest. Okay. Great. Well, that one uh, sounds exciting. We're going to have to follow that and see how that plays out. But. I hear we've got some pretty exciting news coming out of Freeport's Morency mine as well. Yeah, I was looking through their corporate presentations recently. I'll hold up a page that's from uh, the most recent one. It's entitled Brown Food Development Projects. And what they're saying there is that they've got the Morency Mill expansion uh, substantially completed, and it started up in May. That's going to add 225 million pounds of copper production per year. Uh, it's been the uh, efforts of about a one and a half billion dollar expenditure so it's been a pretty significant project to add that additional copper capacity. Well how much production now will Morency be able to do on an annual basis? Yeah they're gonna really uh, become a very very large producer not that they're not already our, our flagship operation but this is gonna push them to over one billion pounds a year. A billion pounds a year of copper coming just from the Morency mine. Yeah if we can you know hold on to a, a three dollar or three and a quarter uh, a pound price, you know, that's, that's a few billion dollars. Uh, do you know offhand what that does in terms of Morency's rating, ranking on the global uh, picture in terms of copper production? You know, I, I don't, but certainly historically Morency's, you know, been in one of those top 10 categories. Uh, this will certainly uh, not let them drop anywhere, so they'll stay, stay up in the top of that list. All right, pretty exciting. Hey, I've got in front of me a uh, new report that uh, is coming out of uh, your office here, uh, Arizona Mining Claim Forms. And uh, we're going to be releasing this here uh, uh, this month. But do you want to you want to explain what you've got in here? Uh, this is one of those efforts that came from Mines and Mineral Resources and that we're continuing here at the survey as a service to the public. It also benefits the Bureau of Land Management and the County Recorder's offices. Uh, years ago, uh, you could go to your mom and pop stationery store in many of the mining communities and find uh, from Forms Inc. or for you know some others that have a number of these common location notices, maintenance forms, uh, quit claim deeds for mining claims. 
but as we've gone to these uh, global players, you know, Staples, Office Max, those have disappeared. And so because people were foundering to come up with their own forms, uh, we put these in our laws and regulations governing mineral rights in Arizona publication. Okay, it looks to me we've got, uh, looks like about nine different forms here. Uh, location notice for load mining claim, claim map, notice for placer mining claim, performance of annual work, maintenance fee payments, quick claim deeds. So this looks like it's a pretty comprehensive uh, compilation of all of these forms. And so we're going to have this as a hard copy product that people could get, but it's also going to be online, I suspect. Yeah, and, and BLM will update their, their links to, to the new form. One of the things I've done over time, uh, BLM, the county recorder's offices, have learned of various problems people have had completing the forms. So we've added some check boxes. We've added some clear definitions of who's the locator, whether they're an agent or they're actually the locator that's going to own the claims. Updated some of the recent uh, increase in price fees, and uh, there's a page with some links to some useful maintenance forms at the Bureau of Land Management. So people should hopefully find this uh, easier to use. If not, I'm always looking for that feedback. And of course, it all still uh, hopefully complies with all the statutory regulatory requirements of the law, both federal and state. Okay, well, this is great. So uh, I'm sure we're putting up the, uh, the URL here on the screen so people will be able to find this online and it will be online, freely available, download it, uh, print it out as you need uh, at no cost. So it looks like it's going to be a great service uh, uh, for the, the mining community and for uh, local government and uh, federal and state agencies as well, having a consistent, reliable set of forms that, that really solve the problem. So kudos. Good job there, Niall. Thanks. Thanks. If I may add just one thing, if anybody's watching this broadcast and they're uh, one of those light minute, last minute filers, there is now an ability to pay your maintenance fee with the Bureau of Land Management online. So don't panic. Try that new uh, tool. Okay, fantastic. All right. Well, thank you as usual, Niall. Uh, exciting news this month. Uh, we'll look forward to seeing you next month on AMR. Looking forward to it. Thanks. Joining us now live via Skype from Reston, Virginia, the USGS headquarters is Steve Fortier, the director of the National Minerals Information Center. Steve, welcome to the Arizona Mining Review. Thank you, Lee. It's a pleasure for me to be here. All right. Well, you're relatively new in the position. Um, tell us a little bit about what's your background, and, uh, and, uh, and we'll get then into a little bit about the centers that you're now running. Sure. Uh, I am new to government. I've only been in the, in the director's role for four months. Uh, prior to that, I, I spent most of the last two decades in the in the private sector in industrial minerals. I worked uh, for many years for um, a global uh, industrial minerals mining and mineral processing company called Emerus. Uh, worked on carbonates and kaolins uh, and abrasives, uh, refractory minerals. Uh, so I've had a lot of experience with industrial minerals um, and, and uh, a lifelong interest in minerals and, and career in minerals and, and is what interested me in, in this job. Uh, and you're a geologist by training, I take it? I am. I uh, have a master's and PhD in, in geological sciences. Well, great. Well, welcome to uh, welcome to the USGS, and we're excited to have the opportunity to work with you and get you on the show here. So, I think most of our viewers are probably not that familiar with the National Minerals Information Center. So, can you give us a, a snapshot? Just what is that organization, and and and, and what's it do? Yes. Uh, the, the center actually has a long history. Uh, it was originally part of uh, the Bureau of Mines for many years and came over to the survey in the mid-90s when the Bureau of Mines was disbanded. Uh, our principal mission is to, is to collect, analyze, and publish uh, mineral commodity data that is important for the U.S. economy and, and national security. So the, the, the publications that people are familiar with from the center are, are things like the mineral commodity summaries, mineral yearbooks, we publish mineral industry surveys, metal industry indicators. So the same sort of publications you see routinely from the survey dealing with mineral commodities come out of our center. Okay, I know the mineral commodity summary is something that we look forward to every year here, and uh, we usually uh, blog about it, report on it, and, and share it with the, uh, the rest of the community. So I know that one in particular is one that everybody in the mining industry in Arizona pays a lot of attention to. So 
I understand there may be some changes coming along or planned uh, for uh, for the center and the program overall. Yes, uh, the center is uh, is undergoing, uh, I, I think, a, a one in a once in a generation change in in terms of uh, the folks in the center. It's not just me as the director is new. We've just hired a new mineral commodities section chief. The global minerals uh, analysis section chief is, is has only been there three years. Uh, we have a, a vacancy in our statistical information section for a section chief that we're currently recruiting for. So there's a turnover at my staff level, as well as in our team of very capable um, mineral commodity specialists and country specialists, folks that actually uh, uh, vet the data and, and analyze the data and write the publications because of, uh, of a wave of retirements. Um, in the past few years, we actually have added a lot of new people and, in fact, are making a net add in headcount after many years of decline. So um, in terms of, you know, the makeup of the center, there is a, a big change underway. And and, uh, and along with that, a number of other changes that uh, um, are, I think will address some of the things that we've not been able to do in recent years that we would like to do but have not been able to do because of uh, budget constraints. Okay, can you give us an idea of what are some of those things that you're you're hoping to be able to do with these changes? Absolutely, and, and one of the one of the principal areas is is in material flow materials flow analysis. We've historically had some capability in this area and and done work in it, but the resources have um, have diminished over the years, and our ability to deliver on that part of the mission has diminished. We are adding headcount back there. We are also very keenly aware that we need to revitalize our uh, interaction with our state partners. Uh, and so that, this is why I was particularly pleased that you reached out to me um, because our connections with our state partners are, are important. And again, it's an area that has been under-resourced in recent years. And then we've got an active program to uh, remedy that, catch up our state chapters in the yearbook, re-engage with our stakeholders at the state level, and and uh, and make that a strong part of our program going forward. Okay. Well, I know uh, our our survey has worked with your office uh, uh, ever since it's been in the USGS and also before when it was part of the Bureau of Mines. And I, uh, working with my state geologist colleagues around the country, I think everybody uh, feels that uh, it's a great service you provide. And I think we've been uh, trying the best we can to to make sure that we give you the information uh, to to aggregate and, and put together. I've seen some numbers that uh, say that you you get more than 18,000 uh, cooperating uh, companies or organizations providing data to you? Yes, we, uh, we canvas annually uh, and, and also on a, on a quarterly and monthly basis a large group of stakeholders. It's uh, all of the information that we get through our canvassing is actually voluntary. Uh, and so it really depends on on having relationships with with people in companies and in states to to get access to this information. People are not obligated to supply it, and 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 so um, uh, uh, we have to make sure that we're maintaining those relationships that that give us the access to data that otherwise we would not have. Uh, how many different reports do you put out a year, and can, what are some of the, the more recent ones that? Uh, we may be familiar with or some of the ones we may not be aware of that we probably should be taking a look at. We, uh, the number of publications annually is in excess of 700. Uh, within that, uh, each, each chapter in the yearbook is counted as a separate publication. It appears as a separate publication on our website, uh, even though it comes out in a bound volume eventually. Um, and, and each of the commodity summaries in the, in the annual report is, is a separate commodity. Then we have monthly uh, mineral industry surveys that, that go to folks like uh, that are used by, for example, the Federal Reserve to help them understand the performance of the economy to, to, uh, to set monetary policy. Um, we've just published a fact sheet on tungsten processing facilities globally um, that was work that we did uh, in cooperation with the Department of Commerce and Department of State in support of um, disclosure and compliance requirements resulting from the Dodd-Frank Act, um, where companies who are doing business in the U.S. have to disclose whether their materials, the materials that are going into their products are coming from conflict zones. So um, there's a great deal of, of, uh, of concern, for example, around 
um, materials coming out of the conflict zone in the Democratic Republic of Congo and and not wanting to get that into the supply chain for um, uh, producers uh, in, in the U.S. So we published a fact sheet that has a has a list of all of the um, facilities that process uh, the raw ore into intermediate materials that can then go into value added products so that people have an opportunity to trace their supply chain back to uh, to the source and, and ensure themselves that they're not sourcing from these areas. Wow, that's a fairly major and complex undertaking. Do you, uh, I know for, for quite a while there, the, the Mineral Resources Program uh, and the USGS has been struggling uh, with, with limited financial resources to be able to carry out all of the mission uh, that, that you're challenged with. Um, are things fairly stable? Has there been any indication that there might be some growth um, in the Mineral Resources Program and in, in your office in particular? Yes, I think if you look at the numbers over time, we clearly have stabilized and we're starting to make our way back. Um, we are adding um, headcount, as I said. Uh, um, it's at this point more of a reallocation of funds within the Mineral Resources Program, for which we are we are grateful. But I think there are some very hopeful signs. Uh, there's an increasing amount of focus and attention on the issues around material uh, availability and security in Congress, and uh, I think that that will ultimately translate into increased support. But these things kind of go in cycles. We get periodically concerned about getting access to materials, and then we, we sort of relax, and, and then things go back uh, to the way they were. But uh, we're in one of those cycles where there is increasing uh, attention being paid, I think as a, largely as a result of the issues around rare earths a couple of years ago. And and that's the kind of thing that gets everybody's attention and makes them realize that, hey, we have some vulnerabilities here that we probably should be paying attention to. I think we're in one of those cycles. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. Well, you know, a couple minutes ago you were mentioning how many, uh, how many companies voluntarily provide uh, the statistics and the information to you. Um, are there still more companies that, uh, that you want to reach out to? Because uh, that's one of the things uh, we might be able to do through this program is make sure that either companies that didn't realize uh, you're there or had, had not thought about contributing information, what can we do at the state level to help uh, encourage companies to provide this information because it, it really does look critical for the economy and for the industry. So uh, what kind of uh, uh, additional help might we be able to provide? I think, you know, you make a good point there. Um, we find that in our respondent database, we get the best response rates when we have trade associations or active involvement from local organizations like the state geological surveys. Um, and so we've been making a point of uh, asking folks to help us with that, um, particularly in areas where we are, are not getting as good a response rate as we'd like. So I think, you know, again, this is another reason why we need to, to re-engage and, and make sure we're, we're communicating well with our state partners, because I'm sure that you guys can help us. Uh, and, 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 and the relationship we have should be a two-way street. It shouldn't be just us getting stuff from you. You should get stuff from us. And, uh, and helping us um, access folks that aren't inclined to respond uh, for one reason or another is, is, a, is a, a real way that our, our stakeholders can help. Okay, that's good to know. So we'll be following up with you and also through the, the Association of American State Geologists that, that we belong to here. Uh, we collaborate very closely together. Uh, within, among ourselves and with the USGS. So um, that's a good message for us to take back to, to our membership. And I, I have the, uh, I have next year's annual meeting, which I believe is going to be in Flagstaff, on my calendar already. So I will be there with one of my staff. Okay, that's excellent. And for our viewers who uh, hadn't heard about it, the, uh, the state geologist's annual meeting will be in Flagstaff, Arizona in uh, June of 2015. We're proud to be hosting and organizing that meeting and Steve, we're delighted that you're going to be joining us. Uh, it's going to be a fantastic meeting. Uh, we've got uh, some great field trips lined up already and uh, an incredible program. So uh, thanks for giving me the plug there or the opportunity to plug that. Um, so uh, what's what's new on the horizon that we might be looking for from your program? Some. Uh, particular uh, studies or reports that you think are going to have a big impact that are in the process right now? The, uh, the, the thing I mentioned earlier on tungsten is just part of a larger study called 3TG. Uh, it's tantalum, tungsten, and tin plus gold uh, in, the, in the conflict zone in Democratic Republic of Congo. There will be a series of fact sheets 
followed by a larger publication coming out on that on that issue. Um, we are looking at uh, potential disruptions uh, and an impact on on economies of uh, the situation in the Ukraine and Russia. Um, we we did some work early on when the when the, the Crimean uh, uh, issue came up, and we're following up on that with some more detailed analysis of uh, particular commodities and economic impacts that could result. We've got a number of um, recycling uh, material flow studies that are in the works on, on base metal commodities that should be coming out over the second half of this year um, and, and are considering a, a large number of other projects now that we are able to, to add back some strength uh, to, uh, to uh, look at uh, the second half of this year going into next year. Okay. One of the areas we haven't really touched on uh, is the digital data revolution that's underway. And uh, I, I, you, you mentioned 700 publications coming out. How much of, of your results are in digital format and online that, uh, that can be used in, uh, you know, in a kind of a computer type approach as opposed to uh, uh, hard copy? We've, we've made progress on that in recent years. All of our publications are available as PDFs. Uh, our data series are uh, available as Excel files that people can download. Uh, I, I see a lot more um, opportunity uh, for us to, to make improvements in that area, not just in what we publish and make available, but how we handle information internally that will improve our productivity and allow us to spend less time doing uh, mechanical work, I would I'd characterize it, and, and more time doing analysis. Uh, and, and free up resources that way, in addition to, to being able to add back headcount coming from industry, uh, we were constantly focused on improving our productivity, and, and it's no different uh, for me uh, now. I see lots of opportunities for us to adopt m modern tools, for example, for document management, and we're, we're overhauling our database for the, uh, the basic uh, mineral commodity data sets that we collect to, to move that to a SQL database that will allow us to um, slice and dice the, the data more effectively than, than the tool we have now. So we're, we're looking at all those things. I mean, clearly the way people access and consume information today has changed completely in the last 10 years. And, and we, need to, we need to adapt to those changes and, and take advantage of the, of the tools that are out there. And we are actively engaged in doing that. Okay, well, that's great to, to no, and uh, I think that's something we'll be following up with you because that's an area that we've been focusing on here in Arizona and, and working with the other state surveys and have a uh, higher level agreement across the USGS to work with uh, digital integration uh, capabilities. So I think uh, this could be a great model of where one of those uh, areas of partnership where we could put that into effect. We're we're starting to uh, run out of time here. Uh, let me uh, give you a chance here. Is there anything else that we haven't touched on that uh, you'd like to uh, make sure our audience is aware of before we, we wrap up this segment? Well, I just would like to reassure folks that, uh, you know, the, the, the center is not going away. I know uh, in recent years people are aware that, that we've been under pressure like everybody in government uh, uh, for funding. Things have stabilized and are starting to improve. We're going we're gonna to be there tomorrow fulfilling our mission and, and uh, continuing to have our, our broad coverage of mineral commodities and our broad coverage of the countries that we, we study because the U.S. economic and national security interests are global and comprehensive and, and we fully intend to continue to, to have that broad mission and at the same time add back some capability to drill down in, in certain areas that, uh, that are important uh, such as strategic and critical minerals uh, going forward. Okay, Steve, thank you so much. Uh, couldn't agree more, and and uh, it's it's exciting to hear that the center's uh, not only surviving, but it looks like you're going to be uh, able to uh, build on your your long-term strengths because uh, what you're providing for the industry and for us here in state government has been uh, incredibly valuable. So I want to thank you for joining us today, and uh, we'll look forward to seeing uh, new reports from the center and maybe talking to you uh, as some of these new new products come out and hear the results. Thank you, Lee. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Take care then, Steve. All right. Well, our next guest is Dr. Phil Perthree, who's chief of the environmental geology section here at the Arizona Geological Survey in Tucson. Phil, welcome. And uh, you've never been on the program before because generally uh, you're not working in the, in the minerals area. 
Right. But last year, you've been putting together a new map in the Phoenix Valley that has big implications for the mining industry. So tell us what you've been working on. Yes, we've been working as, as part of the state map program. We've been working on a, on a sort of a re recompilation map of the entire Phoenix metropolitan area. It's the main focus of it being that we want to better map the deposits that can be used as aggregate resources. Um, so that's that's what we've been working. We had some existing mapping there. We've approved that mapping. We've made it uh, more of a seamless map, and uh, it's we've we've set the map up to to clearly identify the kinds of deposits that are have been used for aggregate and are likely to be useful for aggregate in the future. Aggregate and sand and gravel yeah, used yeah. primarily in construction. construction right, right, right. Construction aggregate, which is a huge, huge resource. It's the largest volumetrically resource that sustains our urban areas. So. Okay. Well, what what prompted this? Why are we doing this now? Well, there was a I think two or three years ago the uh, Arizona legislature passed a bill that required local communities to consider aggregate resources in their in their planning and their okay. future planning documents and so so as, as they began to do that and using the existing geologic uh, mapping data that was available it was clear that some of the mapping could have been done with more 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 with aggregate resources in mind and and more clearly so that planners could use them more easily right well historically i mean we've mapped everybody maps with various geologic parameters, and we're not necessarily designing our maps based on how you define an aggregate resource. So the planners, I understand, looked at this law and turned to us and said, show us a map with the aggregate resources, and we showed them a geologic map. So right. what you've been doing is creating a new version of the geologic mapping out there and, and redoing some of it in a way that the planners can understand the aggregate resource potential and what, where they need to be preserving that. Right. So the numbers I've heard are that if we have to haul aggregate and sand and gravel more than about 40 miles, it doubles the cost. And some of the numbers show it may only be 20 or 30 miles. So if we don't preserve the aggregate locally, mm -hmm. and you start having to haul it in from outside the urban areas, the cost of building roads, of foundations, of housing, everything is going to go up dramatically. Right. So that was the driving factor behind the law, which was make sure we don't just build subdivisions and strip malls everywhere and preclude the ability to, to make sure that we can get our aggregate nearby. Right. And the other one, another issue that's related to that is, of course, for example, the Agua Fria in the West Valley. Agua Fria River is a huge source of aggregate, uh, t at least 10 aggregate pits, large mm -hmm. pits along the river, right? But that's an area where uh, there's been a lot of development uh, that's gone on that's really quite close to those pits in places like Sun City and other places. There's been some land use conflicts right. over the existence of the aggregate pits, many of which were there before the development occurred. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that, that's another issue to set aside areas that we know this is where the resource is. So if you're going to consider develop, you know, putting a subdivision right next to it, well, you know, that's that's going to be a problem. So it's better to anticipate those kinds of things. And then the other issue is, of course, what our maps. One one thing our maps illustrate is how much of the potential aggregate resource in the Phoenix area has already been built over. I mean, there's a tremendous amount of area along the rivers, and that uh, will never be developed for aggregate because it's it's intensely developed, urbanized. So so the key in going forward on the margins is to identify the aggregate areas with aggregate potential and set some of those aside at least so there's a sufficient resource to sustain the development. For at least a few decades right. going forward here. Right. Now one of the one of the things uh, that you found is that the only certain of our river drainages really are producing the aggregate. What what right. did you find? Well all, really almost all the all the large scale aggregate production in the Phoenix area is along the major rivers. So the salt, the birdie, the salt the Gila, the Salt and Gila together, and then the Agua Fria. Those are the main sources. Those are large drainages. They drain large watersheds. The rocks, the sand, and especially the gravel gets transported a long ways before it gets to the Phoenix Basin. So the rocks tend to get, the soft rocks tend to get broken up, and that makes the aggregate uh, quality uh, better, and they, they have lots of different kinds of rocks in them. So. So all that makes for a relatively good aggregate quality, and, that's, and it's also relatively large volume deposits. So all those things together have made the. There have been there are some pits on smaller drainages as well, but the big producers are the are along the major rivers. So our mapping clearly defines those those 
four rivers and plus the Hasiampa River, which is out west. It hasn't been developed very much just because mm -hmm. not much development has occurred out there. But those are the five major rivers and we've identified the deposits associated with those rivers. And then there's another set of, of smaller, but still pretty good sized drainages like Cave Creek, New River, Queen Creek in the East Valley that are also, have been sources of aggregate in the past and not on lar as large a scale, but we've also mapped those deposits explicitly in this map. So okay. those kinds of things. So you've identified some areas that planners can now look at and say, this is where the major resource, the best resource is, Let's make sure we set some of that aside and don't zone it for new shopping malls or something else so that that aggregate will be preserved for right. decades here. We have, and uh, basically our map should be seen as interpreting, it should be interpreted as a, this would be the kind of the maximum extent of the potential aggregate. If a producer is going to go in, they have okay. to do more detailed assessment right. of the quality of the product in, the, in a particular place and the land use and things that they do. but. But we have given them a map, a template, really, to say these are where you could have uh, aggregate that's that's you know usable, and uh, they can they can go from there. So I think in terms of going forward, you'd probably want to. I mean, it's not necessarily every area that has river deposits needs to be set aside for aggregate, but those are the areas where you could potentially have aggregate resources, and some of those areas should be should be. Uh, the zoning should take that into account going right. forward. And so we now have the tools, at least in the Phoenix Valley, for the local developers and the planners to help make those kinds of decisions. Okay. When when will the final product be ready that we can hand off to the to the planners? Yeah, the, the map is basically finished with a little bit of quality control. So I think that in a couple months, mid mid October is our target date to release okay. the map. We'll also have a short report explaining our mapping methods and how the units okay. were, the map units that we used and those sort of things and some idea about the, the value and the limitations of the, of the mapping. Right, and we've run this by some of the aggregate companies to make sure that the, the uh, qualities that you've defined in there are ones that really make sense that they use in term in determining what would be a, a economically viable product and resource. Right. Yeah, we have. But I think we'll, we'll give some, some key uh, potential users another chance to look at this as a final, okay. final uh, review. I think that's, that's our plan. Okay. Now, at the beginning, you mentioned this was uh, from the state map program. That's the U.S. Geological Survey uh, National Cooperative Geologic Mapping Program. And the state map is where they provide matching funds to state geological surveys. So mm -hmm. AZGS put up money. We got matching money from the feds to do this one map. Yes. Uh, but this is the only one that's been funded. Right. right. Yeah, we had we tried again for the uh, to do another year of this kind of mapping down in more in the, in the Costa Grande area, but uh, the, and it was reviewed by a different panel or whatever and they, they decided that it wasn't appropriate for a state map because it wasn't new mapping. So uh, we might be able to spin it a little differently in the future. <laughs> but, but we haven't we haven't tried again because they rejected that part of our proposal. Right. So right now, this is the only area we've mapped, and right now it's the only one that, in the near future, that we, we anticipate we'll be able to uh, right. find resources to do that. But, well, it may be a chance to uh, take it out, test it out with, with the industry, with the planners, with developers, and, and see how it works. And uh, it might be the kind of thing we could come back and try again, because it seems like something we're going to need across all the urbanized areas uh, across the state. Right, I think if we get the methodology down, and, and uh, it'll be a little different in every area, but certainly like, like the Casa Grande area or the Tucson area would be pretty similar to the Phoenix area in terms of the geology, basically. So we could certainly use the same kind of concepts in those areas as we did in the Phoenix area. Yeah, okay. Well, is there anything else that uh, we haven't covered on this project that you want to I just think it's been uh, it's been an interesting experience. We had we had uh, you know four one hundred thousand scale geologic map sheets that were compiled together, but they actually weren't the edges weren't put together. So okay. it's been my opportunity to make the, the the geologic compilation map of the Phoenix area better as well oh, as the okay. aggregate stuff. So that's one of the spin-offs that came out of this that hadn't really been thinking about. Right. Okay. Well, that's great, Phil. Thank you very much, and looking forward to seeing the final product out that we can share with uh, the developers and the planners. And right. And the other, I just mentioned one thing. I mean, I, this is designed to be a digital product. Uh, oh, right. The fact that if we if we printed the map out at the scale that we've compiled at 100,000, it would be a huge map, paper map. So we may not even do that, but it'll be available, you know, be a PDF or all or art, you know, shape.
yeah. shape files, an arc yeah. map. In a GIS yes. kind of format, so you can exactly. work with it exactly. on that's, the computer. That's how we envision mostly right. being used. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think that's where the local planners have all been moving in recent years at the city and county level, so it sounds like this will be uh, give them the kind of product they need, both in content and format, to be able to work with it. Excellent. Well, great. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Well, that wraps up another episode of Arizona Mining Review. Thanks for joining us. Our program is produced and directed by Mike Conway. Behind the camera is Stephanie Marr, and editing is Jordan Maddy. We look forward to seeing you next month on Arizona Mining Review.